If you would have met one, you would not recognize that that's a lion or that's a tiger. What the hell is this? It's a freaky looking cat. And he was enormous. I mean, he probably stood here. All standing on all fours. I mean, something like this. Now, could you imagine that? I'll draw it for you. Amphimachirotus giganteus. My first skull was an opossum. My second skull I bought and studied was this. Amphimachirotus giganteus, giant prehistoric cat. A saber-toothed cat. This is bigger than tiger, this is bigger than lions. It's bigger than Smile It On Popular Tour. It's a big, big, primitive, old model that went supersized in saber-toothed cats. This is not a typical shape for a cat jaw. The teeth are quite typical, but the shape, it is a reflection of the times. It is a reflection of the type of cat this cat was. Those are its canine teeth. Those are its incisors. It has a long, large diastema. Premolar, premolar, molar. Again, the two cuspids of a cat. A coronoid process. Reduced allocating strength to different portions and favoring different movements of jaw musculature and chin flange. See, there's another pattern here, which is where the muscle that would open the jaw, the digastric muscle, would attach to. The chin, foramina, holes where neurology innervated. Incisors, canine, um, premolar, carnassial. The canine tooth, it's serrated. It's like a steak knife. Now it's orange, that's probably from like the color of the deposit from the soil. That's orange and that's white. And there's this very characteristic pattern on both sides. And that is actually what's really interesting is all paleo art regarding saber tooth cats. He needs to take this in account which is a gum line, descended down gum line. In for orbital foramen, whisker pad, nerves is also quite big. Sagittal crest. And this is all thin bone, thin crest. But all of this would have been supportive of really, really big musculature. I mean, look at that. biting power. And then the top of his skull, the back of his skull would have been like, I mean, he had a serious bias in like the pulling back mechanism. These are just where tendons would have gone through over his occipital condyle. Well, it's big, but like it's not massive. I think it was very head mobile. I think he was very reliant upon one specific sort of motion. Then he was doing something very particular with his head. These are mastoid processes a lot more developed any big cat today. Their fossil record is kind of spotty. Spread out throughout Eurasia, all the way from like from Greece to China, throughout northern India. There's definitely specimens of this size in Africa of Machirotus kabir, suggesting this ecotype, suggesting that there was this role niche at that time. He was a very sharp. There are several papers that describe this species. Machirotus horriblis falls into this morphotype. The ones found in Europe also seem to present with this sort of pattern, although I don't think fully figured them out. This specimen came from China. It's still by far much bigger than the horriblis uh, specimen described, and quite a bit bigger than uh, all big cats described in literature. Guangzhou, China the Guangzhou province, where a lot of fossil material comes in, especially mammal fossils that I've seen that are just tremendous. Late Miocene epoch, 
nine, eight million years ago, these things lived on a diet of civetheres and rhinos and elephants. I mean, these were the days, man. I think these things were really at the glowing times. Ooh, this is different. Now that makes a lot more sense if I grab it right here. Look at that. All of a sudden, that makes a lot of sense if I grab it right by the top. Oh, wow. That is quite something. Whoa. Could you imagine? And this thing had probably very de well developed shoulders, very well developed hands. Very impressive beast this must have been. He is slightly different. However, Amphi Mykyrotus shared the land with a fearsome and deadly adversary. That topic of a further video, further discussion, and further investigation. And thank you for tuning in.